And then I want to tell you four stories of work that we've done uh, with, in a community context with emerging businesses and uh, the relevance of that, I think, to a Rotary Club audience. This is my uh, background. And it's unusual for a business educator, I think, in that my background, my training, my undergraduate training, my professional training was in the arts in the first place, but not what I would call fine arts or high art, more than what we used to call community arts and then community cultural development. So this is the idea of artwork, performing arts, visual arts, video, internet, and etc., being used by usually disadvantaged groups to make some sense of the world, to bring people together, to give them a voice, to help them represent themselves at various purposes, but they're usually social purposes, the notion of social benefit. And we found um, over time, um, at about this, this point, I, I got very interested and I remain interested and passionate about working with Aboriginal people. And we find, found that we'd walk into Aboriginal communities, we'd do some sort of project helping them set up a gallery, for example, to attract the tourist market. And then the money would dry up, they had no money of their own, it would always be government money. The money would dry up, the experts would fly home, and there was a real risk that the sustainability of that intervention, to use the word, wasn't there. You know? So as they say, you don't give people fish, you start to train people to fish. Um, and we found ourselves accidentally in the, the business of uh, employment, employment generation, regional development, and eventually small business training. So it's an unusual trajectory for a business trainer. But we found it very useful, particularly in the context I'm talking about tonight in communities, because it turns out that business, I think, any business, is not just about the money. Um, I, I shared with Mick the stats, there's research that shows that um, people who go into business, all other things being equal, don't make as much money across a lifetime as people who work for somebody else. Now there's exceptions to that, there's always the Bransons and, and etc. But generally speaking, people who go into small business are not doing it for the money. I mean it's certainly about the money, that's what makes it a business, not a hobby. But it's more than just the money. If you scratch the surface, you ask people about why they're in business, they'll say it's about making money, but generally it's also about values and making meaning. They'll, they'll tell you things like, it gives me some sense of control over my life, it gives me some sense of direction, or sometimes I just can't work for any other bugger. You know? <laughs> well, and that's like me. By now I'm entirely unemployable. You know? I wouldn't employ me. Too idiosyncratic, too self-directed, doesn't work well with others, not a team player, that sort of person, idiosyncratic, opinionated, typically. So we found ourselves accidentally in a good place when it comes to business education. Everybody's talking about innovation these days. They go to a seminar, they all get excited, they come back to the workplace and ask themselves, well, how? We know we've got to innovate. We know we're in the 20, 21st post-industrial economy now. How do we actually do that? And I've got some ideas, <coughs> or we have some ideas for that. So there's a social orientation. Our company's DNA is make money, have fun, change the world. To echo, what I, to reinforce what I just said. So making money is the question, is this sustainable? Is this financially viable without having to go hands out to some big brother or big sister? That's what makes it a business in the first place. But on top of that, have fun is the question, is this meaningful? Does this make sense to me? Does this help me become a better version of myself? Does this help me with families? Aboriginal people, for example, will always, almost always tell you when you ask them the question why you're going into business, will say that it's to help the family, to keep the family together, to do something about violence in the family, to get Uncle Rex a job. It's always family oriented. So is it meaningful? Does it pay? Is it meaningful? Change the world, which should not be a surprise to a gathering like this, is, is this socially responsible? Does this actually make a difference to the community that I inhabit? So we look for what we call win-win-win business situations, whereas I as your supplier win, you as my customer win, and in the process of us doing business, a third party wins. The environment, the rainforest, the Aboriginals, whatever it is. Um, so, to make money, have fun, change the world is what we're on about. And it's been very influenced by a group in Denmark that I've been mixed up with, uh, they were mentioned in the previous slide, since about 1993, called the Chaos Pilots. Like us, they came to business education in an unusual way. 
It was founded by a social worker who was working with rough kids in the town of Aarhus, which is the second city of Denmark, the university city, and started doing more or less successful community interventions with these rough kids, um, and had the bright idea that after a while, you could actually turn that into an education. You could train people to work with the same kids for some sort of purposeful outcome, might be employment, might just be non-violent behaviour in the street or whatever. And that too found legs in a business environment, in the emerging business environment. So it's quite a big brand now in Scandinavia. They've branched out into other places in Western Europe. It's sort of a business school, it's a three-year course, but a business school with a difference because it retains this idea of value. When we talk about business, we talk about generating value, some of which can be measured financially, but other elements of which can be measured socially, culturally, economically, I mean, even spiritually, if you like. So the chaos class, and you can tell it's not the usual image that you think of when I, when I use the phrase business school. So this is the first of the stories I want to tell you. Um, I was working for QUT at this point. Uh, we worked with a group, a, a small circle, about six to eight indigenous um, elder women in Mount Isa, who didn't want to start a business at all at first. They just wanted to create a women's space that would be safe. There's a lot of domestic violence and um, drug and alcohol fueled violence in that town. And they wanted a place, a safe place for women. And some bright spark working with them at the Salvos said, well, there's this business idea. You could actually get involved in what's now called a social enterprise. So I was on the hand, it's a whole story, but um, worked, them, worked with them over about three years, developed a business plan and put a bespoke paper making business on the ground. Um, it lasted about seven years, then fell over, which is another story. But dur during its heyday, it was employing about eight to nine indigenous women. And by definition, you know, I was talking about the win-win-win. They found that even though it wasn't designed as such, it actually became a safe place for women and girls in that city. Not least because it was located at this jump up, the old mining museum in Mount Isa, if anybody knows the Isa. Um, so they were physically elevated above the town, which by itself was a bit of a statement. This is the sort of thing that happened there. Paper making is a useful business for this kind of situation because a fairly low threshold in terms of skills and equipment, the actual finances of it, and you can produce a saleable professional product fairly quickly. They were value adding to their product by storifying it. Okay? This is the buffalo, buffalo, buffalo grass we used to feed the cattle on when, when times were tough, those sorts of stories. And it did very well for itself for a while. Um, some of the ladies. Interestingly, one of this, the mill itself, one of the walls was open to the rest of the street and that created this interaction with passers-by. Not just indigenous, they were saying, you know, uh, this business is, is for all women in Mount Isa. And it led to some challenges when it came to business planning. I just talked, heard somebody talk about a hundred, hundred page business plan. I don't know if ever, you've, you've done the exercise of a formal business plan. But typically, the problem with it we've discovered for small business startups, anyway, is you put a lot, enormous time and in investment into a 60, 80, 100 page A4 document, which goes out of date almost straight away and it very often spends most of its life in a filing cabinet. It's not a very, in my opinion, workable document. So, given that some of these women were um, functionally illiterate, I don't know if you know that ASIC, ASIC rules say that if you're illiterate you can't be a director of a company. So there are a lot of uh, issues like that that had to do with governance and uh, operations in the company. We found, we found we were drawing spirals and circles a lot because that's the way things go up there. There's no, not in that culture, there's no straight lines, there are no um, right angles in it. That's story one. Story two, a young man called Tim. Uh, more or less profoundly disabled, needs 24 hours um, care. A uh, little cloth there as he's dribbling all the time, makes sudden noises. Generally somebody you'd write off. He did our uh, Build Your Business course. Um, so it's for startups with a carer who translated, helped him write things, stuff like that. <coughs> His idea was uh, an organic um, seedling business. This is up in Gympie. His dad was an organically certified farmer. 
uh, so it had the equipment to actually sprout and grow um, organic seedlings. We worked with him to create, this is our business plan, the one we use, it's called one page business plan, so in place of 80 pages of prose, you actually boil this down to one page. We, we teach you a set of tools that you will use to populate a one page plan, so it's a kind of dashboard. But the point of it is that it's written for you, the business uh, proprietor, the business uh, owner, not for some funding agency or bank manager or lender or whatever, for you. It's a working document. This is designed to be blown up, put on the wall of your workplace and consulted every day and probably changed every day. Because in business, I don't know about your experience, but your markets are shifting all the time, your product range is shifting all the time, you need to actually turn on a dime and move very quickly and be very flexible in a business. So this is Tim's business plan. I'm pleased to say he did it in 2012 and he's just hit his first milestone. He's just bought a van. He can't drive it, but it's big enough to get his wheelchair up into the back. He's got a very supportive family and um, uh, family circle. And that's been enriched through his business by virtue of access to farmers markets, which are becoming, as you know, very popular, and the organic farming circle around Gympie and Fraser Coast. So he's doing quite well. Now he, never, he knows he'll never get to a point where he can be entirely independent, economically <coughs> or otherwise, but he needed that van because symbolically it meant freedom for him. It meant mobility for him. Remember, make money, have fun, change the world. That's story number two. Getting a bit closer to home now, story number three is a, a project um, with disengaged young people up on the Sunshine Coast. This is at the old ambulance station in Nambour. Um, we're now offering form accredited training. Up until now, the company's about seven years old. We've been offering informal training, not accredited. Um, now we're offering a Cert 3 in micro business operations and a Cert 4 in business administration. This was the Cert 3 version, and this was our first um, graduating class. Uh, very strong support from a community agency. Each of these kids, um, the younger people that you'll see in the group, and it was quite a range. We had sort of uh, 14 to about 65 years of age in, across this group. Um, all the young people had left school uh, by year 10, uh, physical and mental issues, uh, de developmental behavioural issues and so on. And I'm pleased to report we went to their graduation this morning. The, uh, the youth agency put on a sort of fancy graduation, so we put on fake mortarboards and did a, a, a graduation handover. And now all but one are in a job. Uh, so that's our kind of idea of training. You know, there's a lot of training that goes on that, if you'll pardon the French, I call bullshit training. So training that goes nowhere, you know, because the funding structure is set up by virtual bums on seats or throughput of trainees. So the responsibility of trainers typically finishes when the kid or the, the person graduates. You know? um, we like to think that we, like to, we connect the dots and we connect training with, actually, with actual job outcomes, including self-employment outcomes, but not restricted to self-employment. <coughs> Even closer to home also at the end of last year, this is a group of uh, Young people, also disengaged young people at Deception Bay. Um, the agency we're working with there was Deception Bay Community Youth Programs. Fifteen kids, half of them Aboriginal, half of them Islander backgrounds. Tough crowd, you'd normally think, but we loved it. After a few scary moments at the start, because these are pretty tough kids, they fell in love with this idea, because those tools that I mentioned before are consciously designed to be simple, flexible and easy to access. And as soon as they start to get the sense that business is not about ripping people off, that business is about creating something of value, they're with you. And in fact, you'll find, and I haven't seen numbers on this, that very often your creative entrepreneurs, not your gyms mowing franchise owner, but your gyms, will often come from the fringes. They won't come from the centre. And that makes sense when you think about it, doesn't it? Because if you're on the edge of something, you have an interest in change. If you're in the middle of something, you have an interest in things staying the same. So if you're looking for innovation, if you're looking for outside the square thinking, think about the edges. And that's one of the messages, I think. You know, we, we treat people like this, kids like this, very often 
in a deficit modality. We see them as a problem. I think we can change our point of view. I think we can change our perspective if we think of them as assets. Unrealised assets, but nevertheless assets. We know that hip hop, I think, is worth $20 billion, $20 billion a year. Um, the, the, and it's not my music, for sure. But it is a big industry. And that came off the streets. That came from this sort of collection. Each one of these kids who started the course, it's five full days of training followed by coaching. And right now there's a mentoring process that they've engaged to actually take them through from the training into jobs, including self-employment. It's probably three businesses that I think are viable that have actually emerged from this group. But there's a number of these kids that are now in jobs that they wouldn't have had otherwise. The program was called My Life is My Business. So you can actually, and you think about it, you can actually use a lot of business decision making tools in your own life. You can do a SWOT analysis on your life. Do a SWOT analysis on your marriage if you're going. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Where are the opportunities and threats? These are uh, two of the kids, one of the businesses that I reckon could actually fly. And this is not fiction. These kids are not very far away from us right now. Sana and Chrissy, they've got an idea. We do this uh, three-dimensional modelling thing, so we're bringing a lot of bits and pieces from a place called reverse garbage, factory offcuts, glue guns and stuff, and so give us a picture, make a, make a sculpture of your business concept. And we brainstorm concepts like the value proposition, the customer, the, the market segmentation, the, 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 the cash flow situation of the business, and they find physical representations of that, they make a little sculpture, and then we do a, like a, a faux art gallery opening. So each of the artists has a floor talk and we, we do little canapes and mocktails and they go around and they explain the business concept with this sculpture. It sounds pretty straightforward. It's a remarkably effective tool, uh, particularly with kids like this. One of the things, somebody asked me earlier what, what uh, possible relevance is this to a, to a club like the Rotary Club. One possible uh, relevance is that you can find kids like this. People do a lot of uh, mentoring out of business clubs, and that's, that's good, you know. And those kids could actually use it, so I can point you to them if you want. Particularly if they have expertise in financial planning and management, or marketing. Those particular skills are always valued. These kids are investment ready, in my view. They're, they're a t-shirt production business. They're, they're selling at uh, markets at the moment. It's called Realist. Um, Hip-hop designs, again, very Islander sort of flavour. But they've got the nows, they haven't got the schooling, but they've got the nows, they've got the motivation to actually make that business happen. And there's a particular machine that they need to buy that uh, they need help with. One of the things that I think people like you can do more than just mentoring, sitting down once a month over a coffee with kids like this, is to actually invest in them. Fairly low threshold businesses, you're not talking about, you know, five digit dollars. Um, if you talk about fairly modest investment, but hook your mentorship to an actual investment. I mean, I don't know if, it, if you'd agree, but I, in my experience, there's always a different experience if you've got a bit of skin in the business, you know? You're not just a tourist giving advice from above, you actually got money involved in the business. So I offer that to you as an alternative. If you ever think about mentoring, what about actually coughing up a few bucks and, and helping these kids get a business on the ground? That's the fourth story. So it's about perception. You tell me if this train's going into the tunnel or out of it. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> it's coming out. Coming out? Yeah. No. No, no. <laughs> Stop. If you look at it carefully, you can actually change the direction. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make it come out of the tunnel, you can make it go into the tunnel. My point is perception. Okay, so it, it's possible to actually, as I said, said before, to see young people or other disadvantaged groups, people with disabilities in our community is another classic one. There's numbers just recently about not only the um, employment rate for people with disabilities, but the participation rate, the number of hours of work people with disabilities get in this country, and it's been dropping for 10 years. It's shameful. So there too is another opportunity, in my view. Rather than seeing these people as problems, we can ask the question, what do they have that can actually be constructed and monetized, commercialized, as an asset in the community, where that produces value in terms of jobs, but also social impact in terms of, in the negative, removing kids from um, getting into trouble, in the positive, 
actually enlivening a multicultural, multicultural community like the one we live in. Um, is it? Windows. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> well spotted. Um, so I think that's all. Oh, just another on the matter of perception, just very quickly. Here's two famous entrepreneurs. Do you recognise these faces? Yeah. Bobby Shock. Well done. Uh -huh. I think you're the only person that's got both of those right. Ever. Good on you. And the ironic founder of the Bobby Body Shop. Okay. A business built from the beginning. This is a model, I think, of the sort of business that we're going to see in the 21st century. The Body Shop makes a handsome profit. It's owned by the Wise Foundation in Australia. Um, it's got built into it a social mission. So you get employed by Body Shop. I think you get a day off a month to actually invest your time in a worthy social cause. Okay, so they do recyclables, it's animal testing, all of that sort of stuff. But they actually put their money where their mouth is. And guess what? It's good for business. Why is it good for business? Because in post-industrial businesses where we're selling services rather than things, usually, authenticity counts, honesty counts, mutuality, conversation and trust counts. So if you can present yourself, if you can brand yourself as a business that represents those values, you will actually see it at the cash register. You won't only sleep better at night, you'll actually see it at the cash register. And there's research I can quote you on that. Florence Nightingale, a lot of people don't know, invented more or less single-handed, there was an American doing something similar, the, the, the profession of nursing. She did it on the back, no government grants around then, she did it on the back of a private teaching hospital that she founded and ran as what we would call these days a social enterprise. Both of these people have designed businesses that are not only profitable, not only make money, but I actually, I presume, they're having fun in the sense that it's intensely meaningful work, but they're certainly changing the world as well. And that's my presentation to you. Thank you very much. So I'm not sure if you'd, you're interested in cost questions? Did I go over time? Yeah, yeah anybody? Hello, Maggie. Any questions, Jimmy? While this is coming from our conversation on the weekend, can you talk about the Sango group who's getting together over, over a meal? Uh, yeah. The, the group and the um, fitness or whatever. Okay. We started up something um, last year when the G20 was on. There was a few people in Sango. I'm a, I'm a four, we're calling, a four, calling ourselves 4017 Tragics now. There's a lot of people. I'm, I'm really enlivened and inspired by my community in Sandgate. There's a lot of activity, a lot of um, community activity. Um, during the G20, on the, the, the G20 weekend, we set up uh, in the uh, Bowls Club an event we called Our 20, which was taking the G, the idea was to take the G20 themes and give ordinary people a platform to talk about those at a human scale and relative to local issues. 50, 50, 60 people turned up, we had some guest speakers and then what's called uh, World Cafe Technology where you're pretty much like this, you sit around tables, you have a discussion, you share that with other tables, you bring it back to your table and etc. And people found that a really useful exercise, so on the strength of this, this is non-party political, non, there's no agenda we say except the agenda you bring. You know? So on the back of this we've established on the 10th of the month, every whatever day of the week it is, a long table dinner. So we provide the, the space, the Sandbank Community Centre, we're thinking of actually going down onto the beach for the next one. Um, people bring potluck, people bring a dish, um, and they, they, one of the unexpected side effects is people actually make a bit of an effort. You know, they cook more than they need to and they cook something special. So you should have seen it. We had 44 people turn up for the very first one. We had a table from me to that, ta that back table, long, we ring it at no agenda, like I say, we get a, an introduction process happening around the tables to start with so people know who they are. Each other. We suggest a general topic of conversation. In the, the first one it was uh, Sandgate as a creative community. And then we go, and off we go. So it can be a social, uh, well we ring a bell every 20 minutes to suggest that people might like to <coughs> shift around a bit and we ran a bar, um, which was for Sandbag's benefit. 44 people turned up, huge response. You know, we were expecting maybe half a dozen. 
you know? And there it is, every month. Um, costs nothing, costs the, the, the act of sharing some food with people, and we've started one up on the sunny coast as well. No agenda, political or otherwise, except the agenda you bring yourself. Just about, a bit like this, the act of sharing a meal, the act of uh, fellowship, of knowing, getting to know other people. In, in Sandgate, I overheard a conversation about um, uh, getting together a community power supply uh, company, a little bit like they're talking out at Sanford, or some, something similar, or the Rainbow Energy Company for you hippies down in Nimbeth. Self-supporting social enterprises that uh, actually have social good as an outcome as well as uh, revenue. Um, the one in Nambour was much more modest, but um, that's picking up steam as well. Michael, uh, do you know anything about permaculture? Yeah. Are you aware of the edge effect? So we've got a, we can mimic, in terms of the social organisation now, there's an example in nature where change happens at the edges. Yeah. And that's the productive area of the system. So if anybody knows anything about agriculture, uh, permaculture is uh, a system of design which uh, postulates in one aspect at the edges of your system, like where a forest meets a range, that's where all the activity takes place and change happens. Yeah. For instance, birds fly in and out, food systems change. So it's a social organisation that's talking about that actually mimics a natural system. Yeah. Within that and how you run and your comments on mentoring, are you actually joint venturing or working with any social group like Rotary uh, to effect change, you know, backwards and forwards into both systems? in a formal way, organisational way? Not in any systematic way. We do it pretty much ad hoc. We, all, of, all of the stories I just told you involve partnerships with um, often local government and um, not-for-profit sector, occasionally business. Um, to do this sustainably in partnership with an organisation is a whole story by itself. Um, but we believe very strongly in partnership and leaving something behind when we exit a situation. It's just never turned out or played out to be a sort of an ongoing partnership. We have some good partnerships emerging in other parts of the world, um, Cambodia, China and Europe just recently, um, which is another story, and some partnerships with um, co-working spaces, a little bit like the Redcliffe Hive down here. But I'm a member of the Redcliffe Hive, but not um, that one in particular. Um, I like your metaphor about permaculture. We use it ourselves and I'll remember that edge business now. Um, the one I like is if you, you're designing a permacultural property, the first house that you build is the kitchen. When you think about it, that's the most you know, important house room in the, in, the, in the house really. You build outwards, in other words, from the kitchen. It's not a, in, for example, in that uh, beginning of the uh, organisational diagram for the Arilla paper business, that front, that middle, middle circle, true to Aboriginal dock painting conventions, is the hearth. The campfire, you know, see those roundels in traditional paintings, that's typically a sitting down place or a camping place, which is around the food, the tucker. I don't know about you, but which, which is the most busy, which is the busiest uh, room in your house when you have a party, you know? So the first, ha the first room you build is, is the kitchen. So where you feed people, uh, where the sustenance comes from, where the resources come from if you're talking about a business, revenue, um, you build out from there. The first garden that you plant is the kitchen garden. So your herbs, your small veggies and, and fruits and etc. To, to, to feed the cow and out you go from there. You know? So you start at the kitchen where people sit down and share a meal. And that's a bit like what the long table is about. We can't predict what comes out of there because we don't want to impose our agenda on it. You know? We want it to actually come up this way. What's the, uh, what is it? When you're running the business course and things like that and here locally, what's the biggest unmet needs that the business community and business owners have that um, Rotary would fill? So you talk about you know, money, fun and changing the world. Like where can Rotary add value to the local uh, business community? Um, I don't think it's about the money. I, I, I really don't. I think uh, there's a couple of ways I could answer the question. I think 
The more I go, the more I train in business, I've been doing this for about 10 years now, the more I understand the two key qualities for business success are resilience, how to deal with setbacks, failures, bear traps, speed humps, and persistence or commitment, not taking no for an answer, staying committed to your idea even when times are, are tough. You're not, you're not born, we are not born with either of those, we learn those and we can train ourselves in those, usually in the University of Hard Knocks. You know, you can't buy a book on resilience, you, know, you can buy a book on resilience, but that's not going to teach you to be resilient. Falling down and picking yourself up teaches you to be resilient. Now you can help people to do that. You can help people to be committed over time to a business idea. The skills that come with that are good, but at the heart of it you've got to actually have the internal fortitude, so to speak, to actually stick with a business, because it's bloody hard, you know. I mean, we try to actually, unlike a lot of academic presenters or government presenters, you know, these people, these academics stand up and do business courses and they've never started a business in their life. You know, or, or govies, you know, from the small business department turn up and lecture us on how to run a business. So we're trying to actually walk the walk as well as talk the talk with these people. And this sort of, I call it the affective dimension, the personal dimension, the dimension of emotions, um, communication, fellow feeling, that sort of level of stuff, is critical. If you've got that, then you'll get the skills that you need, you'll get the resources that you need, and you'll direct, develop the, res, uh, the revenue you need. If you haven't got that, you can have all the resources and, and assistance in the world, you get a, the first big speed bump you hit, you run away. You know? So I reckon, um, again, mentorship, but I would actually call it something like critical friendship. So you could dedicate an hour of your um, life every couple of weeks to a kid like Chrissy or Sana, sit down with them, and just essentially, you could give them advice, by all means, business advice, but essentially give them the message that they're okay. Daniel Pink has written a book about motivation. He says there's three motivators for human beings. The first is material, so money, um, shelter, car, all the things that you know, money can buy, uh, but it turns out that there's a fairly low threshold for motivation beyond, I think it's about 40,000 US dollars. So you're making 60,000 Australian dollars or better, that uh, doubling that does not increase much your, your motivation or your commitment to your business. You know, once the basic, uh, basics are looked after. What's much more powerful in motivating people and I think helping with business success is validation like I just said, it's okay to be you. You, know, you can be a big Samoan girl, but you can still be a business success. That's perfectly all right. And affiliation, a sense of belonging. That's one of the reasons I suspect most people are in that, this room. We actually like and need, as human beings, to feel like we fit somewhere, that we belong somewhere. So if you can again tell that kid or convince that kid or just have a relationship that convinces that kid, it's okay to be you and you belong in our community. If they've got that going, they're likely to get the persistence and commitment and develop the resilience they need to actually make a quit. Thank you very much, Roger. Yeah, it's Lawrence, please stick to the data, thanks. Thanks, Michael. I wish I had a voice like yours, uh, Michael. <laughs> I, I think these are terrible things also. Thank you very much for coming along, coming over the bridge. Um, I read that uh, your father was a Paul Harris fellow, so yes. you obviously know something about Rotary, and I thought that last point that you made about affiliation probably describes why we're all here. The other thing that I picked up on was you used the phrase, I think it was post-industrial uh, uh, community or society, and uh, uh, that's exactly where we are right now, and so the concept of work is changing quite dramatically, and you're finding little niches to, uh, to go into and uh, we can all see around our community here where people have fallen uh, through the cracks and they need uh, help. How you motivate them, I'm glad if I know, but uh, um, there's certainly some challenges uh, around the place and, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't just shrug our shoulders and say that, uh, well, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're lost people, um, you know. What you've done in Mount Isa, I think, is wonderful, and uh, the young guy up at Gympie. Thank you very much for coming along and sharing your stories with us. And um, we're a little bit entrepreneurial here, oh, too. Uh, we uh, 
Um, one of our members uh, started a few years ago the idea of the Rotary calendar, and uh, uh, we'd like to share that with you. And thank you thank very, you very much. much for coming, and look forward to catching you again. Thank you.